I'll get a tanner in. Like Lynn, I thought you were behind me. Oh, he's killed her. He's killed her and done himself in. We don't know that. We don't know what happened. Somebody else might have been involved. Who? I don't know. Now come and help me look for them. sale on Wednesday, the 17th of June. And the first indication that something is wrong does not come until Monday, the 22nd of June. Now, this is no normal crime, this. It's not just one person missing, but there are two. Socks. Ten pairs. Underpants. Men's. Eighteen pairs. The name's Bruce Roddick. I'm a casual labourer, working on local farms. Last Friday morning, I was working for Mr Chitty. That would be Friday the 19th, wouldn't it? Yeah, that's right. I didn't notice anything then. But later, about nine, I saw the crew's car parked outside the front gate. How did you know it was their car? Seen it before. A green helmet. And there was a woman standing just inside the fence. She seemed to be looking in my direction. She would be in her thirties, about five foot ten, five foot eleven. Can you give me any more details? She had fair hair. Not blonde. Light brown. She looked quite good looking. And you think uh, that she might have been Jeanette Crewe, eh? Well, I thought it was at the time. But from what Mum tells me, it couldn't have been her. Well, she's got black hair, hasn't she? Anything else? I mean, anything else you can remember at all? Everything's important, eh? She was about medium build. I wouldn't say she was slim. Would you recognise her again if you saw her? I think I would. All right, Bruce. Well, I'd like you to go next door and talk to the detective sergeant. He'll take a statement of everything you've just said to me. Any objection to that? No. I hope it helps in some way. Yeah. All right, Bruce, thank you. This way, please. Bruce, right for you, sir. It just happened like you don't make a step for What do you think? Oh, I don't know, it makes sense. 
Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. No way that child could have survived five days without food. Then you reckon the woman Roddick said he saw her? Fed the kid? Well, somebody did spite. Sorry, Stan, what do you got? I've just taken a statement from a couple called McConaughey. Uh, they'll be coming in later to make a formal statement, but I thought you'd like to know the gist of this right away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They own a farm a few miles south of the Crews, and on Saturday the 20th, they were driving past the Crew farm at 1.30pm, and Mrs McConaughey said she saw someone standing by the front gate. She saw gate. a woman. A woman, very tall, about 5 foot 10, 5 foot 11, medium build, aged about 30, with light brown hair. Well, no, she saw a young child. A child? While she was uh, watching, the child turned and started to toddle back towards the house. Anything else? Well, uh, judging by the description of the clothes, it uh, seems like she saw a shell crew. All right. Well, I'd like a word with the McConaughey's when they come in, if you wouldn't mind. Right, sir. Going off to join the search party. Now they are, do they? Oh, bloody right I do. The buggers are tramping all over my land. <laughs> Aren't you going to join them? No, not me. Well, if you've got any sense, you won't either. Well, looking for your daughter and son or... Let the buggers get on with it. That's their job. For the moment, let's concentrate on Len Demler. All right. Monday, the 22nd of June, just before 1 p.m., he receives a call from his stock agent called Ron Wright. Now, Wright wanted to take some trucks up to the crew farm to clear some sheep. Now, earlier in the day, he'd had another call from another stock agent who said he'd visited the farm, but he'd found no sign of either Jeanette or Harvey crew. So, shortly after the second call, Lem Demler decides to go up to the farm and find out what's going on. He goes into the house where he finds the dinner table with the remains of a flounder meal. Just eaten, he says. He goes into the living room and he finds the carpet covered in blood. He finds his granddaughter in a cot I should have mentioned that, according to him, he heard Rochelle talking to herself when he was by the front gate. So what does our man do? Does he call the police? Does he call a neighbour? Does he grab Rochelle? And uh, get the hell out of there? Now he gets into his car, leaving his granddaughter in a house covered with blood, and drives home. To do what? To call the police? To get help? No. He calls the stock agent about the sheep. And the man's not home, so he waits for him to call back 20 minutes later. And then, and only then, does he go round and visit Owen Priest and ask him to accompany him to the farm. Well, I don't believe a word of it. 
I always thought there was something odd about him anyway. Right, Bill. Oh, good idea. Look, Vivian will be in for the rest of those things later on. Oh, that'll be fine. Okay. Okay. She'll pay for it. Okay. See you later. Yeah. The mafia. No. What on earth could the mafia be doing oh, in like this car way? So they like to do. Good day, lad. How are you doing? I'll be a lot better when half the country stops stranding out of my land. They're only trying to help. Bloody time, they'd be a bit off searching the river. Take a look at things. I'll call paper later, Bill. Oh, by the way, you're doing anything July the 6th? Not that I can think of at the moment. Well, I'm having a birthday party over in the Pukakai Hotel. You're invited. About 8 o'clock. Stan, I want you to get this into CRB records. And get them to run a check on it. Should have it back this evening. This afternoon, if they can. Right. And I also want to know if we've already got anything from Bruce Wright. Right. Hey, come on. Right, right sit down. Now, you're not obliged to say anything, but I must warn you that anything you do say will be written down by me. It might be used in evidence against you. But the last time I came here, it was to help you. Well, that's what we want now, isn't it? Just want you to give us a bit of a hand, old boy. It's right, let's bite. Right, right. Well, why are you treating me like some kind of criminal? There you go with all those questions again, you see. Did you want to be a policeman, did you? No, I just want to be left alone. Oh, you see, I need people with something to hide. Don't want to help the police, Bruce. What are you hiding? Nothing. I've got nothing to hide. Everyone. Everyone's got something to hide, Bruce. So once again, what are you hiding, eh? Uh, Inspector Hutton, phone call for you, sir. Inspector Hutton? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, I'm aware of that. Well, yes, um, we are making progress, yes, sir. Well, principally because I haven't got a body yet, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Constable. So why are you taking so long to answer? Why would I want to murder my own daughter? You tell me. Why don't you leave him alone? Well, I'm not in the habit of ignoring murderers. Now, you know he did it. It's all over the district that you know he's guilty. So why don't you take him home and explain to the stupid old bugger? Well, it's better for him to confess sooner rather than later. We've been at Maitland's for years, and you've lived here. So? So we know you've helped him. How do you mean helped him? You've helped him move the bodies. He couldn't have done it on his own. You're bloody mad. No, you're bloody mad. Because you're going to finish up on a dog charged with double murder. You confess now, who knows? Just leave it there. We'll help. 
fuck ourselves. Hutton's treating me as if I've already been found guilty. The wisest course would be to retain an experienced defence lawyer. Who do you recommend? Lloyd Brown, QC. Might be a bit expensive. Oh, I'm not concerned about the cost. I want the best. There is one other matter we wanted to discuss with you, and that's the custody of Rochelle. Uh, my husband and I would like to take her back to America with us. It's rather early for that, surely. We don't know for sure if they're alive or dead. They're dead, all right. Well, if they're not, why do the police keep telling me I killed them? Well, Heather, it seems a bit premature. If we don't do something, she'll go to Harvey's mother. The wills have to be probated. It has to be decided exactly how much Rochelle will benefit by. We reckon about a quarter of a million dollars. Well, is there any reason why we shouldn't make immediate application for custody? We feel the sooner it's resolved, the better. Evidently. Yeah, it's got to be back on these ones. Oh, yeah, why not? Thank you. You see, this is the home of a wealthy middle class couple, boarding school education. Right? I mean, they weren't short of a few bob, but look at it. I mean, where's the personality? Hmm? I mean, look at that lounge. It looks like a motel room, doesn't it? It looks as if they were about to give up, you know, as if they were going to call it a day or... What else this? They have an argument. One kills the other and then commits suicide. Yeah, all that does, though, is bring us back to Demler. Yeah. Dead men do not get up and bury themselves. Yes. Who wants to know? Uh, Frank Bayless and Harold. New Zealand Harold. We've heard the search has been called off. Can you... They want confirmation that we've called off the search for the cruise. Oh, I don't believe it. Hang on. Bloody vultures. Inspector Hutton? No, no, we have not called off the search. We simply called in the Army, the Navy and the Air Force searches. That's right, it's impossible to keep manpower like that tied up for any length of time. Yes, of course I'm disappointed. Listen, you bright bastard, there was nothing inefficient about that search. Now, we shall find the crew sooner or later. What? No, I'm sorry, I'm not prepared to comment on that at the moment. No, thank you. I heard about the conference tonight, about our recommendation to arrest Demler. Christ, are they going to print that? All things are bloody circus. Bloody circus. Well, we'll get all this stuff over to, over to who tomorrow. You know, I've got to reduce the CIB team to four men. The commissioner thinks that all the rest are needed for other duties. Don't no worry, mate. We'll crack it. Are you staying? You going? Yes. I've got a guts for for one night. What does Hutton want to talk to me about now? He didn't say. He just told me to come and get you.
Gut, Sir. seen it for years. Throw it in the river? Along with the bodies? No. No, it's mislaid somewhere. Farmers don't mislay rifles. But if it is in the river, I promise you we'll find it, Len. And we'll find Avi's body, too. We'll find it a bloody sight sooner if you'd tell us where you dumped them. I've told you. I don't know where it is. Not too keen on us finding them, is he? I couldn't care less. It won't hurt me. You couldn't care less. Are you telling me that you don't even care what's happened to your own son-in-law? What I mean is that when you find his body, it's not going to link me with his death. Why didn't you help us take part in the search, Len? Why did you speak to others and tell them not to help us too? Well, you had enough bloody men up there falling over themselves, didn't you? And what did they find, bugger all? A couple of blokes go out fishing in the Waikato and they find you, Ned. Yeah. And you couldn't care bloody less, could you? Your own daughter, your own flesh and blood, shot in the head with a twenty-two and dumped in the river like a piece of garbage and you couldn't give her bloody monkeys. Yeah, of course I could. I was very fond of her. Oh, well, yeah, of course you were. Now I understand why you didn't open the searches. And that's why you threw a birthday party in Pukekohe? Well, I had to do something to take my mind off it, didn't I? A year ago, you changed your will. You cut Jeanette out of it. Why did you do that, Len? To make things fair. Oh, yeah. Fair for who? Fair, though. And what about Jeanette? Oh, she had more than enough. Must have been a bit of a blow, though, mustn't it, when Maisie died and left half the farm to Jeanette? And Harvey. Do you have any arguments about that? Arguments? What do you mean? Oh, you know what I mean. Sell on the livestock, for instance. The livestock's mine. It's only the land that's divided. Is that the way Harvey thought about it, was it? Bugger if I know how he thought about it. That's how it is. No. I'll tell you how it is, Lynn. And you listen to me really carefully. On the 16th of June, Jeanette discovered that she was going to benefit by nearly $80,000 from her mother's will. That night, you had dinner with Harvey and Jeanette Crewe. The next day, they both vanish into thin air. Four days later, you find little Rochelle in her cot, surrounded by bloodstains, and you bloody leave her there. You leave her there. Eh? Now, what possible reason can there be for that? The only reason that I can think of anybody doing so appalling a bloody thing is because they knew that nothing was going to bloody well happen to them. Hey? All right, now we find Jeanette's body in the White Cato. But just prior to that, you'd been telling everybody that we shouldn't be looking on, on land in the first place. We should have been looking in a bloody river. And then there's your rifle, which is missing. And we know that Jeanette was shot through the head with a twenty-two. We also know that you were alone, at home, on your farm, next door, on the night of the murder. And what conclusions would you expect me to draw from that? Eh? I'm buggered if I know. You're buggered if you know. 
Anything there? No, nothing. Mike, I'd like you to pull in every 22 rifle within a radius of five miles of the crew farm. That means friends, neighbours, acquaintances, anybody who's involved in the inquiry, right? Right. We're still working on the uh, analysis of the wire John. pieces found with the body. Some are copper, some galvanized. John, we still have a murderer to find. Now you get on your bloody feet and concentrate. Yeah, okay. Now you and Murray go and pick up wire samples from all the seven farms on your list. That's Stemlers, the crews, the priests, everyone's right. Right. And when you've done that, Murray, I'd like you to take a party of men, and I'd like you to take the crew farm apart. I know you've done it once, I'd like you to do it again. This is what you're looking for. All right. And ask everyone whether or not they've loaned Demler a rifle in the last year, and whether or not he's been on their property. Although if showing the old bugger his daughter by the river doesn't make him cough, I don't know what will. Excuse me, Inspector. What? That business of uh, bringing Len Dimler to the river. You don't approve of my shock tactics, eh? Well, that's just it, sir. I don't think there would have been any shock about it. He knew where I was taking him. Well, why the bloody hell did you tell him? I didn't tell him, sir. I didn't have to. He's lived in the area for over 30 years. He'd have known in five minutes where we were going. He had all that time to prepare himself. Yes. Thank you, Constable. Perhaps you should have told us that before we took Demler to the river. I did, sir. Give me Graham Hewson here immediately. Hewson's gone back to Woodville, sir. Michael Eyre, I'm Detective Sergeant Charles. We have to take your rifle for a ballistics check. We're checking all the 22 rifles in the district. We'll bring it back as soon as we've finished. It's just a routine check. Thanks. Gerald. How long have you been back from Woodville? Uh, a couple of days, mate. Yeah. Inspector Hutton wouldn't mind a word with you if you've got a minute. Yeah, yeah. I'll just finish this, eh? Hey, you better take off now, eh? Uh, yeah, right. I'll finish this when I get back. Yeah. <coughs> Where is he? Bullshit. Look, can I leave the rest of you? Something to do. Okay. Hi, Graham. How's it going? All right, you look as if you've been working. Yeah, yeah, I've been giving your blokes a bit of a hand looking for cartridge cases in the garden. Oh, anything turn up yet? Yep. Found a complete bullet. Appears one of your blokes planted it there, make sure we're doing a proper job. What about Lynn Dembler? Uh, just the same. You know, when I heard you'd uh, found Jeanette, I thought you'd have that bastard arrested by the time I got up here from Woodville. Maybe you're saying in June, as soon as we find a body, we'll turn the key on Lynn Dembler. Yeah, well, it's August now, and you've got a body, eh? Yeah, you're beginning to sound like my boss, you know. You know, Harvey Crew is my best friend. I don't want whoever done this just to end up behind bars. I want him to swing for it. Yeah, well, knowing he did it and proving he did it, two entirely different things. Tell me about Harvey. Did uh, he own a rifle? Yep. Yeah, I used to go shooting with him. Yeah, by the way, uh, Mike Charles said he wanted my rifle collected from Woodville. Oh, no, it's just because we're collecting rifles from all the friends. When did you last see it? Well, last time I visited him, uh, you know, months before all this business. 
Where to keep it? In the lounge, usually. All we found was a Pioneer shotgun in the wash house. No, no, I'm talking about a rifle. Yeah, well, that's probably in the bottom of the Waikato by now. Are you still, uh, you still looking after the crew farm? No, um, Demer appointed a regular manager a couple of weeks ago. I just drove Harvey's mother up here, you know, when we heard about Jeanette and that. Would you do something for me? Yeah. I want you to keep an eye on Lem Demler. Stay as close to him as you can. Yeah? I want you to uh, remember every single conversation that he has with Heather. Wind him up a bit. You know, try and... Uh, tell you what, tell him that uh, we've got a child specialist teaching Rochelle to talk. <laughs> sure, yeah. I want this bugger as much as you do, eh? Are you sure that that was on the night of the 17th, eh? Yes, I'm certain of it. They came from there. Are you sure? Absolutely certain. I went to bed about, well, it was early, between eight and nine. Surely it's been two months. Why didn't you mention it earlier? Because for the past two months, I've heard you say the crews were killed with a piece of wood or a tomahawk. That's what all your men were looking for, wasn't it? Well, yes, but if you heard shots, why didn't you tell us about it, sir? Because it's only now, when you found Jeanette and discovered she was shot, that it connected. Well, you must be mistaken. But surely you can't have heard shots over that distance? And forget it was a wet and windy night. I'm absolutely certain. Three shots between eight and nine. Well, thank you, Julie. We'll look into it. Now, the DSIR were unable to exclude two of the, uh, of the rifles because there were only fragments of the bullets which were recovered from Jeanette's body. They uh, were unable to categorically state that either of those two actually fired the fatal bullet. Well, one of those rifles came from the uh, air farm. Well, it's owned by a man named Brewster, a friend of the air family. Well, the other's owned by an Arthur Thomas. Thomas, did we interview him? Yeah, twice. Oh, yeah, it's empty. We want to shoot you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, get it back in about a couple of weeks. OK, right. Oh, hang on. Got those letters. Uh... So... Oh, yeah, we're Busy there. boy. Yeah, they're there. These are some letters that uh, Jeanette wrote me. Thought they might be useful. Mm. What was your impression of it? Oh, harmless enough. Yeah, thanks. Hello. See ya. See ya. Bye. No, it's just a routine inquiry. The style of a bloke, mm. isn't it? Apparently he'd been keen on Jeanette at one stage. Found her in the letters, that sort of thing. What, recently? Oh, Christ, no. Glad I may not have told you about it. No, late 50s, early 60s. He got married in 64. We'd run a check on him, uh, car, fingerprints. Nothing. <coughs> what about the heirs? Mickey Ayers, the one I think would be interested in that. He once worked for Harvey Crew. Did he now? He's also got a number of... Handicaps, speech impediment, deafness. He's got himself a bit of a reputation in Pookie Car. A reputation? For what? Oh, just for having a violent temper, for being cruel to animals, for being very strong, and for wandering around at night with a rifle. <laughs> <laughs> strong enough to lift two bodies, is he? Oh, I should say so. No trouble. You see, if Thomas the one we're looking for. And this is the way he would have had to have come that night. Right? right? How far is Thomas from the crew farm? Uh, by road about nine miles. That's where the ratepayer meeting was the night of the murders. There you are, you see. If Thomas is the one we're looking for, how is it that nobody saw him that night? There's 60 odd people about, and no one even sees him coming or going let alone dumping bodies all over the place. Well, the air farm's only three farms from the crew place. Almost as close as Denmark. What sort of alibi do Thomas and Air have? Thomas reckons he was at home on the night of the 17th, with his wife and cousin. And Mickey Air's mum reckons her boy didn't go out at all that night. <laughs> well, just like that? Just like that. Well, wheel them in, give them the treatment. 
Let's hang on to their rifles for a while. All the rest you can return to their owners. Right. Oh, I wish I'd found Demmer's rifle then. Yeah. Or Harvey Cruz. Or Harvey Cruz. Got the go-ahead to arrest them, though. Yep. Glad to have found the other body there. Could have given us a bit more evidence against him. You know, Pat, last night I dreamt we'd found him. Bloody case must be getting to affect me. What about those two rifles? The Nelson thinks they're possible. Aaron Thomas? No, we've had them in for interrogation. Given the rifles back. Emler's our man, all right. Who's this? Jack Wiley. Ah, the intrepid Constable Wiley, eh? Constable, I'd like you to run me up to the Denver farm. Certainly, Inspector, but I've found something I'd like to take a look at before we do that. And what might that be? About three miles downstream, sir. It's a body. Good man. All this money you find. Leave it there to float about God knows where. No, sir, I've left Constable Miller on the spot with his duck punt. His body isn't moving, it appears to be snagged. Yes, yes, all right. Yes. that? Well, I thought you might be able to tell me that, then. Well, looks like a car axle. Come from your farm, did it? No. No, I've never seen it before. Oh, I think you have, Lynn. Why should I know anything about it? Because it was attached to Harvey Crewe's body. At least we think it was Harvey Crewe. It's a bit uh, difficult to tell after all this time. Perhaps you might be able to identify him for us. Right? This way, Len. Shot in the head with a 2 2 rifle. Just like Jeanette. And what have you done with that rifle then? What bloody rifle? Your rifle, the one that's gone missing, or Harvey's, which, funnily enough, is missing too, eh? 
I haven't done anything with any rifle. What about the axle? What was that? Used to weight down a tarpaulin on the top of a haystack, then used to weight down Harvey Crew's body, was it? I already told you I haven't seen it before. Oh, dear, oh, dear. It's going to be a very long night. See you in the office. Well, why won't he believe me? Why is he trying to pin this on me? Well, you see, Lynn, that's where we reckon it ought to be pinned. Much evidence as we can see that we can. Look, there's always something. It would have made life a lot easier if we'd have found the axe and attached to the body instead of at the bottom of the river. Mm. I could have traced the axle back to his farm. And I'd have broken him. So, find out what car it came from, who the last owner was. Issue photographs to the press on the TV, eh? Inspector? Yes. Mickey Ayer's father, Joff. What about him? Well, he did a fair bit of uh, car repair work and trailer conversion in his spare time. Does he? We've already made some headway with that. A vintage car enthusiast identified it as part of a 1929 Nash. Can't be many of those still hanging about. All right, we'll take the axle and show it to Mr Ayer. He may have worked in it at some time. Peter Garrett, another local farmer, does that sort of work as well. Better take Wiley with you. and take some more samples of that wire. Yeah, sure. Help yourself. Take as much as you want. Uh, we'd also uh, like to have another look round for um, any parts that may have come from that axle. Yeah, sure. I'll give you a hand. Oh, no. That, that would be necessary. Oh, fair enough. Did you go on to my father about that? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, you? well, he'd know more about that than me. Uh, Inspector Hutton asked me to uh, pick up your rifle again. Um, any objections? No, none at all. No, I'll get it for you. I think it's in the wash house. Oh, thanks. Uh, You'd like, uh, like a cup of tea or something like that? Be hot work digging around out there. I uh, wouldn't say no, Bruce. Uh, yeah, yeah, thanks very much. OK, all right. I'll organise it. I'll get the rifle. Right, then. Had a bullet in there, Bruce. You'd be a dead man. Thanks. All right, let's do it once again. This time with live ammunition, yes, and with a dummy in the chair. Arthur! They're still in there. How much longer am I going to have to put up with that lot tramping mud through the house? Oh no! Well, they're turning out drawers and cupboards. The whole place is in a hell of a mess. What are they looking for? Folks down there are still looking for parts of that old axle of theirs, I think. What are they doing in the house?
right? Just take a seat. Inspector Hatton, the Thomas is here to see you. Yes, I know, I saw them. Thank you. He'll be with you in a minute. So sorry to have kept you waiting. Uh, would you come with me, please? Uh, no, Vivian, if uh, you wouldn't mind waiting just a bit longer, one of my colleagues will speak with you. Hmm? I'll see you in a minute, love. Follow me. Sorry to bring you in on a Sunday morning, but I suppose all mornings are the same to you farmers, aren't they? Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, had a bit of a late night last night. Went to a dinner and dance. Good time? Yeah, great, yeah. Pajama party. <laughs> As you know, I'm uh, in charge of the investigations into the death of Harvey and Jeanette Crew. Yeah. So I thought perhaps you might be able to uh, to help us, eh? Oh, yeah, I'll do my best. Yes, I'm sure you will. How long had you, um, how long had you known Jeanette? Oh, yes, Mr. Hutton, for ages. We went to primary school together. Oh, is that so? Did you know her well? Yeah, I, I had a real schoolboy crush on her. <laughs> and uh, did you see a lot of her uh, later on? Oh, no, no. She went to Auckland to boarding school, and so I lost contact with her. Oh, I see. So you wouldn't have seen anything of her after that? Oh, yeah, yeah. See, when I was working at Marimarua, she was teaching there, and I used to see her a couple of times at the teacher's hostel. Um, Thank you, Peg. Do you mind going down and seeing if Mrs. Thomas would like a cup of tea? She's uh, with Len Johnson. Okay. Want a cup of tea, Arthur? Oh yes, please. Help yourself. Thanks very much. Do you remember when Jeanette Crew went to England? Um, yes, yeah. I can't remember the date she went though. Oh, oh yes, please. I remember calling on her mum and dad. I wanted to keep in touch with her and they gave me her address in England. Did you write? A uh, couple of times, yeah. Actually, I've got something for you. What's this? It's a letter Jeanette wrote to me while she was overseas. You keep this hidden, did you? No, no, it was, uh, it was in the kitchen drawer. I came across it when I was tidying up after your men had gone through the place. Can't be any use, otherwise they would have kept it, wouldn't they? They should have. Now read it. Oh, sure, yeah, right. Keep it. It's just thanking me for a writing set I mailed to her. I understand you, uh... You also gave Jeanette a brush and comb set, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah. That was after she came back. That was a Christmas present. I told your men about it. Did you like it? Oh. Uh, I think she got the idea that I was trying to hang around, you know. <laughs> yeah. She told me she had a steady boyfriend. Oh, later on, I realised she must have been talking about Harvey Crew. How would it have been if you were, uh, you'd be married to uh, Jeanette Crew, eh? Oh, well, I'd be a wealthy man today. Listen, as I understand it, now you, you correct me if I'm wrong, eh? You were, you were at home on the night of the 17th of June. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. Uh, I had a sick cow. She was due to carve. 
And uh, you were with Vivian and your your cousin Peter, right? Peter, yeah, that's right. Yes, Peter boards with us. Mm. What did you all do? Oh, well, after dinner we watched a bit of TV and then we all went to bed around about nine. We were going to bed at the same time, did you? Yeah, as far as I can remember, yeah. Did you murder Harvey and Jeanette Crew? Hey? No, no, of course I didn't. Yeah, I thought you'd say that. Now, you see, what worries me is all this. Yeah? Now, Harvey and Jeanette Crew were killed with this rifle. That's your rifle. Yeah. Don't touch it. Sorry. Now, the bullets used to kill them had a little eight on the base. The bullets on the board have got the little eight on the base. They were found in your garage. Is that right? Hmm. Now, we have this axle, right? That was used to weigh down Harvey's body. Yeah. That axle belongs to your father. Hmm? And when we recovered Harvey's body, it was wrapped in wire, which had obviously been used to attach the axle. Now, these wire samples, which match that wire, were found on your farm. Is that right? Hmm. And yet you tell me that you were at home on the night of the 17th of June, 1970. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So, you see, I'm worried. Bloody hell, I'm not surprised. Let's go back to my office and have a cup of tea. Oh, what up? You have a slipper, Vivian. No. I'm a light sleeper. See, that way, if anything goes wrong, they've always got me to blame. Ah, oh, you mean you've been framed? Yeah, well, if that's the word for it, yeah, I've been framed by all that evidence. I do have one more piece of evidence up my sleeve. Oh, fair enough, Mr. Hutton. I should lock you up now, but I will give you one more chance. Well, what would you like me to do? Or confess to the murders of Harvey and Jeanette Crew. You wouldn't want me to confess to something that I haven't done, would you? Would you? Oh, that's it. Now. Have I got enough evidence to arrest Arthur Thomas and charge him with two murders? Hmm? No, not yet. There must be something else. I suggest you keep on digging. The police have declined to give details other than stating that the man is from Pukikawa. We'll have more information in our next news. It's all over. It's over. They've arrested him and charged him with the murders. Did he say anything after they charged him? No. Nothing. Not surprised. He's a tough old bird. So, on the night of the 17th of June, he went out after we'd all gone to bed. He took his rifle with him. He drove to the crew farm and killed Harvey and Jeanette Crew. Thanks for like a statement, sir. He wrapped their bodies and carried them in his trailer to the Waikato River and dumped them. During the next five days, I went up to the crew farm and helped him to clean the place up. And I changed and fed little Rochelle. We did this because Arthur had been nursing this raging passion for Jeanette for years. Mr. Tem, Arthur is innocent. 
He never left the farm that night, either before or after we went to bed. He never left the bed, let alone the farm. Now, I know I was in that bed with him. OK. Now, I want you to go over everything you did on June the 17th again. Then every subsequent day up until June the 22nd, we may have missed something. After that, I'd like you to tell me your life story, slowly. Brian can't write too fast. Now we know what Hutton had up his sleeve. Unless I've got my dates wrong, Hutton told Thomas about that additional evidence on October the 25th. Charles didn't find the cartridge case until the 27th. Right. Conspiracy? I don't know. But I'm sure that cartridge case was planted and it was planted to be found. They collected Arthur's rifle for the second time on October the 20th. On the 25th, Hutton talks to Thomas about an additional piece of evidence. On the 27th, they find the cartridge case from the rifle that they picked up on the 20th. <laughs> You'll alienate the jury if you run that. I know. But I'd like our own expert to have a look at that cartridge case. It seems remarkably well preserved for a bit of metal that had been in the ground for over four months. What do you think? How long did they say it was there? More than four months now. Whose fingerprint's that? Whose fingerprint is that? Inspector Hutton. Whose fingerprint is that? Harvey Cruz. Is it Harvey Cruz? We can subpoena you, you know. We don't want to, but quite frankly, if we have to, we will. Hello? Look at the blood stain on the chair and the blood stain on the floor. They obviously match up. Which means Harvey Crew was sitting on this side, facing the fireplace, not away from it. Which means that he was shot from the telephone hatch in the hall and not the kitchen window. See for yourself. It is purely a matter for you. Nothing to do with me at all. You observe the law as I have laid down to you. And within that, taking fair and careful consideration of everything, as I'm sure you will, Vivian. you will reach the verdict that you think proper. The matter now rests with you. Will you kindly retire to consider your verdict? All rise.
extraordinary there was no forensic evidence to link Thomas with the murders. No prints, no hair, no blood. No one saw or heard anything. Usually they leave some trace of something somewhere. It defies belief. Sure, you're ready to come back with a verdict, Your Honour. Under two hours. Didn't take them long. Good. Let's go and hear what they've decided. It's fine. You, you, you got anybody helping you with the milking? Yeah, Jimmy, Jimmy and Sparrow, they come in every day. Are they? Don't really need to worry about that. How's the old Jimmy? Oh, same old Jimmy. <laughs> Dad, you've got to help me. There's still the appeal, Arthur. The appeal. Mm. What's the use? They, they reckon you get three judges at, at, at an appeal. What if I got three like Henry? <laughs> you know? I mean, I, I trusted Hutton. I, I thought he was helping me. How do I know what went on at the crew farm? I was nine miles away in bed with you. I know, I know. Well, why didn't nobody believe us? Why, why did they make out you fed the baby? I don't know. I mean, I, I, I was keen on the girl when I was young. Did that make me a double murderer? Oh, well, well I'm, I'm, I miss you. Oh, it's too uh, sad. We're going to fight this. And we're going to keep on fighting it until we win. the uh, photo in the paper the other day of the uh, flower bed where Mike Charles found the cartridge case. What about it? Well, the police say it was searched for the first time in October by Charles and Parks. That's right. Uh, Mr. Tim, uh, that's not true. They're lying. It was searched in August. It was civ searched a couple of days after Jeanette's body was found. How can you be so sure? Well, I was there. I was giving him a hand. We sieve searched that particular flower bed. Hey, Murray, you collecting these? <laughs> Why would they lie about it? If it was there, we, we should have found it the first time. When we searched that, that flower bed, the only thing we found was a complete bullet. Now, I found it. The police had deliberately planted it there to make sure we were doing a proper job on the sieving. Oh, God, you really were in that search, weren't you? Put him through. Brian, I've got some very good news. 
I've got Graham Hewson here with me, and we can definitely prove that cartridge case was planted. I see. Yes, I quite understand. No, it's not your fault. Don't be silly, Ryan. I'll talk to you later. Uh, Mr. Hewson, I'd like to arrange for you to make a sworn affidavit about everything you've said to me here today. Yes, all right. Now, if you've done that, I'll pass it over to Kevin Ryan. Kevin Ryan? Arthur's new lawyer. Seems I've been replaced. that there will be no second trial for Arthur Allen Thomas. Sir George McGregor, who was asked by the Minister of Justice two months ago to consider new evidence, has concluded there has been no miscarriage of justice. The Attorney General and Minister of Justice, Roy Jack, announcing that no further action would be taken, said, we have been fortunate in having the benefit of a very careful and thorough examination of all the papers by the Honourable Sir George McGregor, a recently retired Supreme Court judge, an ideal person for such a task. I can't take any more, Pat. I've had it. Come on, Viv. You just need a rest, that's all. It's not the end, you know. We'll keep on fighting. I want to divorce Arthur. Hey? I thought that after Arthur had been acquitted, we'd, we'd still have a chance. Now what chance is there? He'll be in prison for years and years. God knows when they'll let him out. What brought this on? I thought you and Arthur were getting along bloody well. Oh, we were, Uncle, we were. Until somebody murdered the crews. Until that bloody Hutton decided it was about time he arrested someone. They took Arthur away more than a year ago, Pat. <laughs> Come on, Viv. You mustn't give up now. OK, so McGregor turned us down. But we keep fighting. We keep working on it. Christ knows how long it'll take. But we will win eventually. And in the me meantime, I I'm supposed to be the dutiful, faithful wife. Well, right now, I don't feel dutiful. And you might as well know the Lord. And last month, I had to be faithful. <laughs> I mean, I'm having an affair.
Thanks. Yeah, uh, Congratulations. Right, thanks, Leo. should be telling me what a good fellow I am until after the trial. Oh, come on, Kevin. We all know the trial's a formality. We'll be back in five minutes with a verdict not guilty. Yeah. <laughs> right now, they're crowing. I think the second trial's going to be a bloody formality, but it isn't. We're going to win it. For two years now, ever since the first trial, they've done nothing but constantly rubbish us. And now's our chance to fight back. I'm going to go for a verdict that will vindicate a lot of us. I've, uh, I've sent a list of the potential juries to the Special squad for checking. I'll be with them tomorrow morning. Mm. Well, the trial's still three weeks off. How'd you hold on us so early? Well, let's just say I have uh, friends, eh? At court. By the time they've finished, there'll be one potential juror on that list that we don't want to be there. Hey, Kevin Ryan's nobody's fool. And by the time he gets the jury wrist, he'll realise what you've done. Yeah, he won't get it till just before the trial, by which time it'll be time to go through the remaining names. Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening. John. We've got a month, and we've got a lot of work to do. All right, first, Roddick. Now, the Crown are going to subpoena him, which will make it extremely difficult for Kevin Ryan to interview him. But in the meantime, then, I'd like you to get up there, get hold of him, and take some photographs of the crew farm from the position that he says he was in, and he was working and saw the woman. Yeah. Is that all right? Yeah. Uh, naturally, the further the farm looks from that position for our purposes, the, uh, the better it is for us. Right? All right, second point. We're going to have a caravan positioned outside the Supreme Court. Officially, it's going to be a rest centre for officers who are waiting to give evidence. And uh... unofficially? Unofficially, it's a monitoring centre. As the trial proceeds, and uh, as we hear the evidence, it'll be noted and it'll be analysed. Every response by his witnesses will give us some clue as to what the defence is up to. All right? It'll be a kind of instant check on developing trends. Now, everything we hear will be checked. And we'll have officers in the field which will go into any new evidence. And we'll destroy. Ryan's defence, piece by bloody piece. Yeah, well, you see, I can't get in touch with him if I don't know where he is. Right, exactly. Thanks very much. Good look on him. Look at his number. Here's the transcript of Ryan questioning Chitty. Okay. Oh, the old Graham Houston story continues, does it? By the way, uh, Peter Thomas is up next. Thanks. Right, who borrowed the mower from you after the cruise went missing? Chitty, Mr. Houston. Right, any other person borrowed to your knowledge? Chitty, no. Murray Jeffers, out of Pookie Carlin? Yep. Uh, can you tell us uh, where the rifle was kept while you were staying there? It was kept behind the door of my room. On the night of June the 17th, the date the crews were murdered, uh, where was the rifle? I don't know. I didn't what know. the hell's Graham Perry doing here dressed like that? Uh, He's got nothing to do with this case. Or the jury list. Uh, I checked on the foreman Bob Rock during lunch. None of the newspapers or the agencies have heard of him, and he's supposed to be an advertising manager. God, I wish we'd had that jury list. Who was helping you with this job? Murray. Could you just check and see if anybody else borrowed Chitty's lawnmower apart from Graham Houston? Yeah, that's important. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. What do you say, Peter Thomas? Yeah. Yeah, I'll do 
for looking at. I thought you were excluded from the court. Follow me, Trout, follow me. Well, then what did Arthur do? Now, when we'd finished with the cow, we went home and had tea and all went to bed about 9 or 9.30. Well, who do you mean by all? Well, Arthur, his wife and myself. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Yeah, well, if you wouldn't mind waiting there a moment, please. Did you ever see your cousin with a rolled gold watch at any time while on his farm property? Never. While you were staying at the Thomas household, did you yourself have a motor car? Yes. What make of the car was that? I've forgotten about Peter's car. Peugeot 403. When you came home, where would you park it? Uh, either, either, at, either at the gate or in the car shed. Would he have been able to get his car out if you had parked your car in either of those two positions? Yes. If Mr. and Mrs. Thomas had gone out late on the night of the 17th... They were really stuffed us then. All he had to do to get Arthur off was to tell one lie. He just had to say that he would have locked him in. Could they have done that without you hearing? And why didn't he say that? No. If he believes that Arthur's innocent, no point in lying, is there? No. <laughs> Whilst you were in the crew's garden in early August, did Graham Hewson help in the search? No, sir. On the 19th of August, did you search an area outside the fenced enclosure? We did. Was he there then? No, sir. He wasn't there at all on the 19th of August, 1970? Not that I saw. If Mr. Chitty gave evidence that the only person to borrow his lawnmower was Graham Hewson, do you say he was mistaken? I do. Mr. Chitty gave that evidence in the Court of Appeal. I don't know what evidence he gave in the Court of Appeal. Mr. Ryan, these questions you are putting to the witness are totally improper. I direct you to stop this line of questioning. Your Honor, why are they improper? I wish to see both counsel in my chambers immediately. All right. It's going well. It's going very well. But just remember that Kevin Ryan can be a very dangerous man when he's on his feet. But also remember that he can be thrown. Doesn't always adequately prepare his case. He'll always derive his next question from your last answer. And often he doesn't write his questions down, so sometimes delay your answers. And then chances are he'll ask a completely different question. Always be positive. Positive. Whatever you do, don't be thrown by his by his manner. And then we've got him. And then we've got him. You have a truck. It's a car, cut down, 1924. Has it been driven? No. It's high time well, when was it last? started to feature in this trial. I wouldn't have a clue. Even if he's not allowed to give evidence. Years ago. Oh. Thank you, Mrs. Ayer. Your witness, Mr. Ryan. Do you swear on oath, Mrs. Eyre, that your son, John Michael, does not go out at night by himself? I do. Has he ever been out at night with a rifle at all? No. Has he assaulted someone in the last two or three weeks? No. Has he been blamed for an assault in the last two to three weeks? I have no idea. Did your son ever go onto the crew property? At haymaking time, when he was working for them. Did he get thrown off the crew property by Harvey Crew on one or two occasions? No. Is John Michael a good shot? I should say so. He is a duck shooter. Did John Michael destroy sheep by breaking their backs with his hands? My son is an extremely kind person. He's an excellent shearer, and he is very kind to animals. Has he ever destroyed animals by breaking their backs with his hands? No. 
Thank you. Mrs. Chitty has just remembered the lawnmower was lent to us twice in August. Houston picked it up once and Detective Moran the second time. I I don't believe that is absolutely great. Great. You're absolutely stuffed, Kevin Ryan. Rotten. I love it. Twice, you say? Twice. I love it. I love it. Aren't you taking it a bit personally? Personally. Yes, I'm taking it personally. It's my case. I have immediately warned the accused that he was not obliged to say anything further, but that anything he did say would be taken down by me and might be used in evidence. I said, look, Arthur, a 22 shell was found near the rear window of the crew's house by the police. Scientists say that shell was fired from your rifle. The accused replied, the murderer must have got that rifle out of my house somehow. I am not a fortune teller. I cannot help you in that. Lies! Oh, God. So many lies. We will adjourn. Fetch a doctor for the accused. All rise. those lies. He's been going on for hours and bloody hours telling lies. Did the doctor give you something? Yeah. Yeah, he gave me some pills. He said they'd relax me. How can I sit up there relaxed while that bastard's perjuring my life away? Look, are you sure you're all right? Yeah. Yeah, why? Well, I'm just wondering whether I should call you to give evidence. Well, you've got to call me, Mr Ryan. You've got to call me. I mean, that's, that's my life they're, they're trying to take away from me up there, you know, my freedom. I'm not frightened of David Morris. I, I'm innocent, you know. I, I just want to tell the jury I, I'm innocent. OK. Water. Graham Perry's here again. Proceed, Mr. Ryan. You mentioned just now to my learned friend how fair you had been to the defence in supplying a list of cars. When was this supplied? I supplied it when I received directions from the Crown Solicitor. I then spent two and a half days going through a police file, which is now six feet thick at this stage. Was there some problem before this list was received? Yes. As a result of you frequently breaking appointments, I referred the matter to the Crown Solicitor. I put it to you that you are a liar! I am not lying, Mr Ryan. Did you allow us to see the wire before it was necessary to get a court order? Once again, I acted under the directions of the Crown Solicitor. You mentioned Mr Roddick. He was a Crown witness in the first trial. Yes, he was a Crown witness at the first trial. Uh, following that trial, and as a result of inquiries made by me, we felt that his evidence was unreliable. So it was not called at this trial. Jim, have a look at this. Have a 
look at one of the other ones. Well, if you... If you weren't framed, what are the other alternatives? I don't know, sir. All I know is I did not do that crime, and I was home with my wife on the night of the 17th of June. I mean, all these things. I mean, bodies picked up out of the water and, and weighed down. They're consistent with a man covering his tracks. Yes, I would say that. Is right? that not why, after you killed the bodies, you wrapped them up, weighted them, and threw them in the Waikato River? Not me, sir. Do you know anybody else in the district who's as keen on Jeanette as you were? No, I, I do not, sir. Do you know anybody who had more reason than you to be jealous of Harvey? No, I, I do not, sir. Really, Your Honor, that question is both irrelevant and improper. Why not ask my client if he knew anyone with less reason than himself to be jealous of Harvey? Continue, Mr. Morris. I'm obliged, Your Honour. You agree with me when I suggest that uh, when you saw Harvey, he appeared prosperous. Oh, I remember him as being quite a big chap, sir. He appeared prosperous? He could be. How did your own position in June 1970 compare with being prosperous? Uh, well, I admit we, we, we had a bit of a struggle, sir. How did your farm, generally, uh, compare with Harvey and Jeanette's in June 1970? I, I don't go onto other people's farms and look at them. I, I look at my own farm and, and my only aim is to produce and to make it better. You have heard the evidence that Detective Hughes gave that you told him you had taken morning and afternoon teas with the crews and that you met Harvey there on the farm. <laughs> are, you, are you simply suggesting that he made all that up if you didn't say that? Yes, I would say that, sir. So that he, like these friends of Jeanette and her father, is lying while you alone are telling the truth? If Jeanette went to Wanganui to get, to get away from me, I can't make out why Mr. Demler didn't bring that up at the first trial, if there's any truth Who in it. Who told you to say that? Well, I know it's not true. Who told you to answer that question that way? Me, sir, because I know Who it's not true. Who told you to say that? Your Honour, my client has already answered that question twice. Yes. Perhaps we should adjourn for the day, Mr. Morris. Court is adjourned. All rise. Hello, Kevin Ryan. Jim, how are you? Are you sure? Yes, I am sure. Are you absolutely sure? Yes, I'm positive, but I need to see the cases again. Yeah. Look, I'll get permission for you to examine them tomorrow. Are you there? Kevin? Jim? Kevin, are you there? Look, there's something funny happening with this line, mate. What was that? I don't give it a say anymore. I think it might be our friends in blue. I, I can't hear you. Look, we'll come over there right now and see you, OK? OK. At the lab. We've got him this time, Gerald. We've bloody well got him. Wait, wait. Yes, thank you. Well, what do you reckon? Yes. It confirms what we've already established. Fine. Well, after we've discussed this... Ryan! What the hell are you doing with those exhibits? How dare you! I shall have every single one of you brought on a charge. You stupid bastard. How did you let them con you? This is a police exhibit. You have no right, no right whatsoever. It's an important exhibit on which I intend to bring further evidence. So do we, Inspector. So do we. Get out. Get out! You stupid bastard. Do you realise how easy it is to, to palm one of those things? 
in an interesting case, this evidence I shall hold you personally responsible. You understand? Thomas called you a liar. Any comment? Is there Thomas called you a liar. Any comment? I think you must be mistaken, the sir. Mr. Thomas is the Who one in the dock. Who the baby? Is there any truth in this assertion? What about Mickey Yeah. Here? So, if seven elements are the same, and if one element is different, that is the end of the matter. That is the end of the matter, yes. You're aware that the two remnants of bullets found in the heads of Harvey and Jeanette Crewe show the figure eight. Have you recently examined cartridge cases from about 16 different sources? Yes. Do those cartridges, with the letters ICI stamped on the base, fall into four categories? Yes, one can sort the cartridge cases into four different categories, depending on the type of impression there is on the base of the cartridge case. I've prepared some diagrams for you. Please explain in detail. The cartridge cases, as I said, can be sorted into four different categories. I then withdrew the bullets from the cartridge cases and examined the impression on the base of the bullet itself. Three of the categories of cartridge case had bullets which had on them the impression eight. The fourth category did not have any impression at all. Well, get back to the corner, will you? David Morris asks anything in cross-examination about Sprott's bloody categories, I want it. Yes, sir. Go on at once, sir. The bills are stuffed. They beat the smoke. Because they stuffed us. Because the 22 bullet that killed the crews had a figure eight on the base. One that Mike Charles here found is a completely different category. Completely different from the one that killed the cruise. And therefore must have been planted. Get on to ICI, Stan, will you? Right. Come here. Mr. This evidence has not been put to the Crown experts. It's been sprung upon the Crown in a most improper manner. Mr. Ryan? I have no objection, Your Honour. I can well understand my learned friend's consternation. But I'd like to point out that we did not intend to spring this evidence on him. It's only just come to hand in the last couple of days. Very well. The Crown may have them examined within this building. As Your Honour pleases. Did you get through to the manufacturers? Yeah. What are they going to give evidence for us? I was 15 minutes too late. Hutton got to them first while we were still in the court. The Crown are calling them. First, Your Honour, we will, in rebuttal evidence, call the general manager of ICI New Zealand. He will swear that Dr. Sprott's categories three and four are basically the same. Hmm. So it would appear that Dr. Sprott has made a mistake. It would appear so, Your Honour. Your Honour, I have not had an opportunity yet to get in touch with ICI Australia, who manufacture the cartridge cases. You can, of course, make an application to open court to have the trial delayed whilst Mr. Cook is flown over. Do you really want to do that? No. In that case, you will have to accept his statement as it stands. And I shall ask you to read it out to the jury. I am aware that you've been kept together for three weeks and have been confronted with evidence that must have strained the credibility of some of you. If there is any reasonable doubt, Thomas must be given the benefit of it. <laughs> reasonable doubt are not glib words from a defence counsel. If you laugh those words away, injustice will creep in. 
must never forget those principles. Now, I did not ask the police officers directly if they had planted the cartridge case. The police officers themselves, from their own assertions, have raised that question. I have made mistakes in this trial. I take the blame for them. Do not blame Thomas. Juries make mistakes too. You can't ignore what happened in the last trial. We haven't got hanging in this country. And sometimes a man is given another chance. Why? Because he is innocent. All Thomas is asking you for is Give him a fair go. Give him a fair trial. All I can implore you is, don't let the ghost of Arthur Thomas come knocking at your door in the future. The murders occurred on the eve of the crew's fourth wedding anniversary. Harvey Crew was sitting in his armchair. Jeanette was knitting on the couch. The function of a jury is to arrive at a true and proper verdict based on all the available evidence. But this jury did not have all the available evidence. The foreman of the jury, Bob Rock, had served in the Navy with prosecution witness John Hughes and also with Chief Inspector Graham Perry, who made several appearances in the courtroom, although he had no connection with the case. This man, this murderer, also had access to the axle, which matched exactly the stubs buried in Thomas's tip. On the 25th of October, 1978, five sworn affidavits were handed to the Prime Minister, stating that the axle recovered from the Waikato River had been removed from the Thomas farm more than a year before Arthur Thomas took over the farm from his father. It was later dumped on land belonging to the Eyre family. You see, they were found on your farm too. Another matter that deserves mention is the evidence of Mr. Eggleton, the jeweler, that Thomas brought into his shop a watch covered with blood during the first trial, the Crown claimed this watch belonged to Thomas. In the second trial, they said it was Harvey Cruz, when in fact a man named John Fisher had already admitted that he had taken the bloodstained watch to the jeweler for repair. The police suppressed his evidence for six years. Also suppressed was Julie Priest's evidence that she heard three gunshots between eight and nine on the night of the murders. Arthur Thomas would have had an alibi supported by his wife and cousin if the murders had occurred at this time. Out of the 64 rifles tested, only this and one other weapon could have made such markings. That other rifle was in the possession of the Eyre family. But according to the British Home Office Forensic Unit, if any other 64 rifles had been tested, at least two more would have been possible murder weapons. Thomas's rifle was uplifted the second time by Johnson and Parks, who thereupon gave it to Detective Sergeant Keith. Detective Keith was not the only person with keys to that cabinet. When Arthur and Vivian Thomas were interviewed by police, they were both shown the Thomas rifle, when, according to the Crown solicitor, it was locked in a cabinet inside a locked room. Two days later, the incriminating cartridge case was found. It is now plain, beyond any doubt, that Dr. Sprott's categories three and four are, in fact, indistinguishable. After the second trial, it was clearly established by the manufacturers that Dr. Sprott's categories did, in fact, exist, proving that the case Mike Charles found could not have contained either of the murder bullets. But when the Minister of Justice called for an independent re-examination of the cartridge cases, it was discovered that Bruce Hutton had already disposed of them on a rubbish dump at the recommendation of Crown Solicitor David Morris. No official record was made of this action.
jury's back. The jury's back! Hang on now. Family first. Family first. Hey. Family first. Would the foreman please stand? Have you reached a verdict on both counts? Yes, we have. I'll say you on the first count. Do you find the accused guilty or not guilty? We have no doubt. He's innocent! Guilty! He's not guilty! <laughs> and talk to the crowd. Right. You must be feeling very pleased with yourself, Constable. Not really, sir. I believe he's innocent. Could have used you on the jury. that you didn't have uh, Peter Thomas make a little uh, thing about maybe blocking in the car. That would have put us back a couple oh, of days. Oh, <laughs> struggling to get a bit more... Uh, what? No, he just had too many guns for us, Bruce, that's all. That was true. You're very good health. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. We did actually have uh, a view of the jury list about three weeks before the trial began. <coughs> Probably wouldn't have gone too much against us. How the hell did you manage that? Well, let's just say we managed it. Very good health. Eight of them, as far as we were concerned. A1. 
for us. Bruce Hutton received a certificate of merit after the second trial for his devotion to duty over many years and for diligence and zeal shown during the crew murder inquiry. Oh, give us an Irish whiskey. <laughs> he was promoted to chief inspector, but then retired from the police force early and remarried. Vivian Thomas divorced Arthur in April 1979 and later remarried. Rochelle Crewe now lives in the United States with her aunt, Heather Demler. Len Demler remarried, sold his farm and moved away from Pukekawa. After six years of constant pressure from the Thomas family and supporters, a commission of inquiry into the case was finally ordered. We have endorsed um, a recommendation from the Minister of Justice that we should recommend to the Governor-General that he exercise the prerogative of mercy and pardon Arthur Allen Thomas of the conviction of murdering Harvey and Jeanette Crewe. On the morning of the 17th of December, 1979, one week before Christmas and nine years after he was first imprisoned, Arthur Thomas, the farmer from Pukekawa, returned home. 